unexpected affinity between vocabulary used by such different politicians. The issue was that if uh, for Reagan protesting a uh, rebelling youth could legitimately uh, uh, have been uh, called beatniks, so for Gamuka, and they were against the capitalism as such, or they were against neoliberal uh, uh, market uh, 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 philosophy embraced by Reagan. So in Poland, Bikiniaże were, were openly for capitalism, and this is how they were called. So even you know, despite uh, uh, similarity language, uh, these youth did, uh, were uh, opting for completely opposite of opposite say, to not be in the circle of, of this capitalist exchange and to be included in the circle of capitalist exchange because they were the private of it. And for them it was a, as a basic standard of life. Uh, but this movie we are talking about, it's from 1960, it is... Uh, 1959. In, uh, yes, okay. Uh, innocent sorcerers. Different sources say differently. But uh, anyway, so, but it is, it is not about 60s. This movie is not about 60s, it's about 50s. And this is a huge difference because uh, those people were uh, Bikiniaja. And the name of Bikiniaja, is, is, it, was, it was coined in, in, the, in the 50s uh, during the Stalinism. And when you, when you watch uh, new reels from 53, 54, then you see the, the, the massive attack on those Bikiniaja as the, uh, as the symbol of, of non-engaged uh, youth. And, and the problem is that uh, the, the, the same phenomenon in the 50s and, and the 70s. So you made, you, made us, uh, you made us the impression that it was about 60s. I, I, it, I, you did... It's about the global 60s. They no, no, but it is not even the global 60s. It is about non-global 50s in Poland. Because those, the, those, those guys well, are but the, the were the equivalent of the Zoot suit, so that's already global. And <laughs> hey, that's 1940s. <laughs> and it starts in the 1940s? Yes, but in, Alexander in, in, okay, so is, I, I, you know, it's, it's fine. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going also to say that uh, Red Sox and, and Jazz, it's not a phenomenon of the, of the 60s, it's a phenomenon of the 50s, because Leopold Thurman, who, who's, whose presence would ask for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, taking him into account, and his diary in 1954 was actually a man who introduced jazz in the early 50s to, to Polish to Polish culture. Of course, it was a, it was a clandestine business, but he was the guy who introduced uh, colorful uh, uh, and striped uh, socks. So, I, many, uh, my point is that many many of those phenomena you are attributing to the 60s have roots in the 50s, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's, it's a different perspective. That's the point. <laughs> So there's a lot of other things, but uh, what I really disagree with is, is, is divorcing ideology and modernity in this case, because uh, it is, it, I think it's a delusion to, to make this move, and, and because for, for many reasons. Uh, the Gamuka regime in the 60s embraced modernity because it had no other chops, but it embraced it in a very cunning way. So because modernity was still controlled by the state as, not, as it was not in, in the US and it was not in, 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 in the Western Europe. So that's the problem. And the state, the state swallowed all those attempts or illusions of young people saying, say, okay, so we are giving you refrigerators, we are giving you those shitty uh, cars and you have to be very thankful to us uh, because this is modernity. There's no modernity which would be deprived of, of, of uh, ideological appropriation. And this is extremely clear in the, in the case of Poland in the 60s. So, going to this picture, I think it's a, it's a more complicated image. Because, of course, I understand there was a youth rebellion, but it was not full-fledged, by no means. Because those students were beaten not only by the, 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 the riot police, but they were beaten mostly by another group of youths taken from factories mm -hmm. to beat their own that's, contemporaries. That's the old view, but there is a recent research that actually people started focusing on small towns and uh, it turns out that even in small towns that didn't have higher education institutions, you have a lot of turmoil and high school students protesting 
So, I mean, this is the, the new research and the new view that comes up. And then people also point to the fact that, well, the number of arrested was about 2,700. Only around 800 were students. The rest were young workers and high school students. So, I mean, this, this, is, this view is really changing. And uh, the old view was talking, basically said there was this division between young, uh, students and workers, and then the solidarity came, and they were all united, right? But that's, that's the kind of narrative that I, I want to revise. So. I, I understand. So, that, so, but, so the main point is, if, if, if you yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Scotia, I thought it was a really terrific, really fascinating yeah. talk. Um, two questions kind of from the perspective of someone working on American history. One is, I'm thinking about this category of the uh, apolitical supporters of the socialist system. And mm -hmm. it seems to me, when I, I think of a lot of uh, youth culture and youth politics in the, the US, it's not, um, it's, it's not so much um, opposed to the going order as it is holding the going order feet to its fire in, I the, in the sense that it is um, people, uh, young people who are um, supposed to be the beneficiaries of a new order as students or the kind of front lines of a new order as, as soldiers being trained to be um, uh, educated workers and consumers and then um, protesting because the ideal seems hollow. And I, I'm, I'm wondering whether there is an element of that in Poland, whether you know there is some meaning in, in a way for, for, for young people so saying that the, the ideal that they believe in is uh, seeming hollow to them. And then the second question is just whether in the, in the American context, it seems to me that young people's political energies move in very different directions, you know, young Americans, freedom, um, as well as the counterculture, or the new left, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether the, the mm -hmm. people's political energies move in different directions in Poland too. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to tell the story in 45 minutes, let me start <laughs> with this, also addressing some of Michal's questions, that it's, it's a, yeah, that there are several different layers, and uh, I address them in my book, but today I was trying to show, you know, a certain argument. It was an argument-driven <laughs> presentation. But um, uh, what young people say in 1968, they, they want to basically hold the system accountable. They keep talking about the Constitution, for example, and basically the basic freedoms. So it's not about um, uh, toppling the order or it's more about uh, holding the leaders accountable to what they are saying. And then about these, all these different movements that we talk about, the, the new left, the counterculture, um, it becomes more visible in the late 1960s in Poland. Um, you, you have the hippie movement, uh, and I know that a lot of people are waiting for my chapter on the hippies, <laughs> which is still... <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I don't want to say that these are that um, the movements are concerned with very different issues because the issues come from the context, right? I mean, um, these are different societies, but I, I, I look at the commonalities more than the differences because I see a lot of things happening at the same time, not necessarily maybe influencing each other, but being a manifestation of a certain movement, generation, correlation of manifestations of youth identity in many different ways, many different contexts, but ultimately um, very similar. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick follow-up question mm -hmm. to that, which is how does Vietnam function in Poland? Because I guess that really begs a whole set of questions about mm -hmm. um, what it means to ask a global question in a different kind of imperial context. Right, those questions are very problematic about the Vietnam because um, if you want to talk about Vietnam, right, 
you have to somehow criticize American policy. And, it's, and if you criticize American imperialism, right, you become complicit um, with the state discourse that is doing the same. So what I'm finding in general, I mean, when, when, you, know, when you look at student movements in the West, the third world place in general is, is an inspiration, and these are the issues that a lot of people identify with. In Poland, it's more complicated because um, the discourse about Vietnam and in general what we call the third world is so much monopolized by the state and by the state propaganda that if you start talking about it, you know, you, you're not really accomplishing. It's not a, a useful tool um, to say, <coughs> however, it functions, actually it, it, it is used as an instrument. So this, the, the people who I was talking about, the ones who were seeking for contradictions, they would often come to these meetings with party officials and they would contradict them and then they would say something, they would quote Castro or they would quote Che Guevara and say that these are the true revolutionaries and what are you doing? So, you know, you, you see that in that way, but it's not, it's not a central issue, it's a very complicated issue. Yeah. Thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. I see here the danger of polarity though. I mean, you have been uh, talking about the global 60s, but mm -hmm. what I see here is the West and Poland. So I was, uh, again, quite a problematic pairing in the sense of omitting or presenting a, a pretty homogenizing view of the second world itself. I mean, I like your periodization very much, but it seems to me that there are two seminal events at the beginning and the end, the, the crashing of the Hungarian Revolution and the Park Spring. So my question is, what kind of mobility, what kind of interaction, what kind of movement of discourses, objects, people inside the second world can one detect in these socialist 60s mm -hmm. uh, of the long 60s and um, therefore how can one therefore situate Poland at exactly as you said at the crossroads of East and West at the same time kind of a follow-up question has to do a little bit with your methodology I'm a little bit confused perhaps because I don't have a very good, clear idea of Poland you started with a very um, bold argument that a party discourse, if I get you right, created some sort of a space, right? A discursive space. Possibilities, yeah. For cultural expression that was then hijacked by the students and eventually turned against the state itself, right? So it's, to my view, this is a kind of, I don't know, Foucauldian analysis from the party perspective, um, I was wondering how this kind of discourse was, I don't know, um, uh, not appropriated, but uh, creatively used by the student itself, or, or whether it actually mattered at all. Because halfway in your narrative, it kind of... Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what I'm interested in, how different people use this discourse and these new possibilities to accomplish their own goals. That, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Great. So why the redefinition of the youth? Hmm? Why the redefinition of the youth in the immediate post-Stalinist era? Why redefinition? Yeah. I mean, why see the youth in 1956, 57, 58 as an agent of modernity rather than the builder of a socialist state? Does it have to do with a broader rethinking of bringing modernity into Poland rather than building an international socialist society? I mean, what's going on in there? <laughs> in 1956, there is a need for a new definition of youth. I mean, you can see this clearly. A new relationship because of the Stalinist system. Um, uh, even youth organizations are being reorganized during that time. The Stalinist definition of youth as the revolutionary avant-garde does not work. Um, and what they do, I mean, I'm not saying that there is a clear-cut state definition of youth, but they are searching for 
that. And I see this also as part of searching for a new identity of the communist system. And as you may know, after 1956, the Soviet leader, Khrushchev, basically legitimates national roads to socialism, right? So every country searches for, the, for this definition of socialism in a different way. And as they become more nationalized, in Poland at least, they also open up. Because, um, because of the way they define this endeavor to some extent. They choose to define this as modernity. Ideology is discredited during the Stalinist period. Communists in Poland have, have always had problems with legitimacy because the system comes from outside, it comes from the Soviets. Um, so it's an attempt to some extent to establish legitimacy. That's another story that and modernity without any designation. They actually rarely use socialist modernity. Although, I mean, you can, of course, identify elements, right? Um, but they use the word modernity usually to basically point that it's not a strictly ideological project. Yes? Uh, since Vietnam was brought up, you can do an analysis of the United States. I mean, it's only males. How many people opted not to go uh, do their you know, service or uh, Mm -hmm. Can you do the same thing in Poland after 68? Was there, were the police able to fill their recruiting goals? I know Poland was a little more, more oppressive, so people really did, well, you can still try to get that opt, opt out, of the, out of being conscripted into the Polish army. Are there any records to indicate that things like that did happen, or did everybody just say, okay, it's, uh, one thing is I want to make sure I get a job later on, so I'm going to play the game, versus, uh, deciding not to play the game. Uh, how is the recruitment to the army? Uh, well, uh, I mean, the people, uh -huh. you got a draft, and you say, all right, um, I've got a bum knee, I can't, finding excuses not to go into the army. Oh, And oh, so the records indicate, were they able to make all their quotas? Did the police have to keep police officers mm -hmm. longer because there were youth not coming into the police? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's mm -hmm. all these things. Mm -hmm. Did everybody just buy into the system, and despite um, I mean, okay, I'm just saying. Maybe, maybe, I don't have those records. Okay, but I'm saying it's yeah. something to look into. Say, um, did the youth, were the youth going along with the state? I mean, you know, it's a minimum. You know, you do your service and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But if if they're not doing it, then all of a sudden the state's well, it's the a state. graph. I mean, they have to do it. Okay. And actually, a lot of the students are, this is the punishment for students to conscript them. Okay, so... Uh, normally, students were not. Uh, they, they, they had an obligation to go to the army after they are finished, after, that, after right. they graduate. And they became but officers. They, yes, Would but I mean, after the demonstrations, they actually conscripted a lot of the students okay. to the army and to, you know, one of the harshest units. <laughs> yes, Mark? I wanted to ask about the idea of the global 60s. Yes. On the one hand, you invoke this frequently. On the other hand, I could hear your talk as a kind of deconstruction of that very idea, or even a refutation, um, a questioning what, what is it that's global about it when we have all of these very different expressions of something. Mm -hmm. I mean, aside from sharing a, a decade or something, what is global? about the global 60s? But you probably know the answer better. <laughs> but um, what is global to me about the global 60s is that the, it's the interaction between global and local. That's what I see as global. Is that somehow new? I, I think so, especially in youth culture. The, the Anglo-American music. Well, uh, how do you, can you, uh, is it a danger of equating American pop culture with the globe. <laughs> but it's attractive. It's spreading. Well, it's not attractive to everybody. I suppose so, yeah. I mean, how do you explain the Cultural Revolution or, you know, any of the, There are all kinds of phenomena mm -hmm. related to youth around the world that aren't necessarily pop culture driven or not, you know, or oriented. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't have an answer. But I, I'm struggling with this because I, yeah. I, I sense something is there, but what is, what is the there that's there? 
And, and I also think that what, what, what I look at is also the, uh, I mean, what, what makes this era global to some extent? The spread of the mass media as well. There is new technology that enables communication in different ways. Okay, you are doubtful. Well, what you are, I, there was an answer already that I thought she presented in the beginning when she talked about Jeremy Surrey, Surrey's argument, where the Cold War and the contours of the, and the context of the Cold War creates an elite that is, what it shares is its repression of outside views, and that only causes in the 1950s a beginning revolt, and in the 1960s, both in the Eastern Bloc and the West, a, a, a revolt that stems from the youth. And that's global. It right. I mean, what I, see, but I don't know how far we want to push the global. Right, right. So what but what, what you can see across the Cold War divide is that the political elites see themselves in contrast to the movements from below. I mean, they, you, you can really see this in those speeches, that's why I showed them. It's not about, you know, pointing to uh, similarities, but it's about the, the same kind of concept, the same kind of cultural construction of youth as the enemy, to some extent. On one side you have the political elites, and on the other side you have movements from below, people who demand all kinds of change or I don't know, Chris. Yeah. So what, 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 you've, what you've posited there is a sort of isomorphic similar, so similarity, right? The similar relationship between the elites and the, and the masses. But you also made an, an allusion earlier to um, something that was a little bit more than that. Um, you made an allusion to explicit references to um, global figures uh, and countercultural figures. So you talked about the Castro. Che Guevara. Um, and that actually led me to, to, to think about the following. Um, in Mexico, which also had its own 1968, um, the, uh, and, and which actually started out as much more um, of a, a sense of a friendly, not a friend, but, a, but of a um, loyal opposition. And it ended up being, in fact, the, the group that ended up being massacred was a sort of a rump group, a larger group that was, that at that point had, had kind of cleaned up and said, okay, we're more or less going to make our peace with the state. These people, and particularly the, the more moderate among them, were quite aware and explicitly following other, uh, other youth movements in the world. They, they didn't make reference on, occasionally made reference to, to you know, the free speech movement, but what, what their real touchstone was what was going on in France. And, and this sort of decolonization, and, 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 this, and, and it wasn't just sort of an isomorphic link, we're, we're opposed to these, but actually a specific critique of power and of the way that, the, that, that power becomes, you know, in, in Mexico and in France, undemocratic. And I, so my question there actually then is, do you see these people um, making specific uh, in, in addition to the music, uh, <laughs> make, but well, no, which I think is important. I mean, it, it, it's a gesture. It's a gesture of a very of a political variety. It wasn't just that they liked jazz. It was like they liked what jazz represented. Right. But um, um, but you also see other examples of this as well. References to France. References to you know other global youth movements at the time. I do. Mm -hmm. And actually. Um well, March 68 is before France, but I see uh, there is, well, that's, that's something that, you know, you could write a whole different book about the transnational exchange and transnational contacts. And there were a lot about Polish and French students, for example. Michnik was going to France and meeting with Daniel Conbendy. And Daniel Conbendy in 1968, when he is on trial for what he did in May, when they ask him, identify yourself, he says, um, Kuroń Modzelewski, which is the, the, uh, the names of the two um, oppositionists from 1956 who in 1964 write the open letter to the party which gets translated into different languages and it circulates among leftist movements all over the world. So you do have that. And you also have images. For example, uh, the youth press, the student press in Poland shows student demonstrations in the West. They, they have images and photographs, right? And, and there is evidence that, for example, set-ins are imitated. 
I mean, to what extent they are imitating? Maybe you, you don't really have hard evidence, but, but you know that students uh, in Poland know what students in Berkeley were doing and what kind of, how they manifested their products. So there are all these elements. And I talk a little bit about them, but still I am more interested in the cultural context and the ideas <coughs> that are uh, defining these movements more than who was there at what time and how they, <laughs> and how they talked and how they influenced each other. Yes. Um, one more question. This hand has been up here for a very long time. <laughs> So, um, so there is a conflict of representation of fields. It's, on the one hand, it's represented as apolitical, and they themselves, you know, define themselves as apolitical and the poles. Uh, on the other hand, we see these huge movements. They appear to be very political because they fight for freedom of expression and you know all these. Um, so it seems that we maybe need to redefine what political means. I mean, it seems that when they think of themselves as apolitical, they just mean that there is no party out there. They can be represented. And so, therefore, they are not the party members. Therefore, they are not political. So It's that's like modernity. It's a subject to different interpretations. Who knows what people, you know, think when they identify themselves as apolitical. Maybe they just say, leave me alone. The thing is, though, you know, a lot of People thought that Turkish youth, for example, is apolitical, and last summer we saw that they are not actually because you know they were just weren't represented in the in the because it depends area. on the context also. Okay. You know, you can be apolitical, but when a demonstration in Warsaw, right? You you see the demonstration in Warsaw, you start suddenly, and you see the riot police attack, you suddenly become. Political. Exactly. So it Involved. seems that they yeah. are in fact political, but um, because they are not represented in a, and they are not active members of the party, it seems that they think of, define themselves as apolitical even though they are in fact political. So that's uh, the fact that they say apolitical doesn't mean that they are not doing anything. So yeah. that goes yeah. back to uh, Rosalie's right. right. point that right. it's not the fact that yeah. they are just you know a bunch of people who waste their time in the streets and you know just dance mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. don't think about what's going on at all. They are political deeply because they are in, you know are aware of what's going on, are responding to what's going on. So they are deeply political and yet define themselves as apolitical due to this lack of representation in the political arena. I agree. Okay. Yes. <laughs> So my question is also about global 60s, but I'm asking as someone who does Russian and Soviet history, and definitely the you know, Soviet Union is not part of this global second world, at least not if I understood you right, but, uh, and this is somehow, you know, going back to, to Michal's question, all these global cultural trends that you define as, you know, key trends for, for youth transformation uh, in the 50s, uh, up to the motorcycle as a kind of image of modernity, you see all these trends in the Soviet Union in the late 50s and early 60s, up until the point of uh, European uh, revolutions of idea of 1960s. And so my question is basically um, whether your research indeed redefines the understanding of global uh, 60s because Soviet Union seems to be part of this new post Stalinist kind of uh, system of global world after you know French movement and movements on American campuses which had no impact at all on Soviet youth culture or Soviet understanding of modernity you know, Soviet youth uh, never was able to somehow integrate and, and relate to this movement. But while in Poland and in Eastern Central Europe in general, you see this political globalization through, yes, indeed, you know, these references to um, movement in Western Europe and uh, in the U.S. And so, my question is basically whether this global 60s again after 
uh, French student pro protests, and before that you had something which was specific to Poland or to the region in general rather than part of global 60s. Oh, the global 60s are starting after 19... As, as a real global 60s... But 1968 is really defined as global 60s. Because yeah, but mm -hmm. you are trying... I think that your project is about global 60s as you know, this rather cultural trend which began uh, at least in Poland in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just I'm asking whether you are making an opposite rather argument showing that this... Uh, this was not yet this global 60s moment, especially compared to, you know, the Soviet belonging to this global world and not belonging to it. Yeah, I mean, I understand the point, but at the same time, when I say global, I don't mean this in a literal sense, in a sense that there are things happening everywhere and we can praise them. When I say global, I basically say how, you know, let's look how local forces interact with global influences, with influences from outside, maybe that's a better term. So it's not, it's not arguing that, look, uh, students are rebelling here and there, and, but, but it's more, it's a conceptual framework. It's about the local context being influenced, especially when you look at Eastern Europe, you have this, uh, <coughs> this paradigm of state and society and we look at it the sort of binary there is state and there is society and usually the state is seen as a force that is trying to suppress society and I'm basically saying let's go outside of this boundary and see how the outside trends especially cultural trends but also political to some extent change the interaction so that's what I <laughs> see as global and to me this is part of the global system but of course I mean, you can have um, as many definitions of the global 60s as there are books and <laughs> articles about the global 60s. Um, I, don't, I don't see this as a rigid concept, you know, as a framework in which you try to fit in. I see this as a useful framework for my work because I really cannot find any other um, reference in a way. But, um, but I do think that all these concepts are very much subject to debate and contestation and the book is about contesting these definitions and the boundaries. So with that, let's thank you. <laughs>